Hello, this is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk about Schumann Symphony Cycles, the fabulous and the dismal, of which there are quite a few. But let's talk a bit about the music itself. Now, as you know, Schumann only wrote four symphonies, although the, the overture, scherzo, and finale is symphonic in concept and really ought to be included with the others, and it's a wonderful work on top of it. So, And we'll see at least one version of that. Anyway, the bottom line is that symphonies can be tricky to play. Why? Because the orchestration is difficult. Actually, it's bad in a lot of places. The problem is people tend to generalize. They say, well, well, Schumann didn't know how to orchestrate. It sucks. Or like Leonard Bernstein, oh, it's perfectly fine. The truth of the matter is it's great in spots and dismal in spots. It's not consistent. And it changed as he got older. His orchestration actually got worse because he was such a lousy conductor and he's trying to make his symphonies foolproof by doubling everything with everyone else. So the Spring Symphony sounds beautiful. The Second Symphony sounds beautiful. The Rhenish, mm, it's got some tough moments, you know. And the Fourth Symphony has an original version, which is quite fresh and lovely, and a revised version, which is more important for what it does structurally than it is sonically. But you can't give up the revisions because he added like the introduction to the finale and all this wonderful other stuff. So it, it really is a question of pluses and minuses that have to be balanced. And speaking of balance, that's really the problem with the orchestration. The problem is not that Schumann was not a colorist or didn't have brilliant orchestral ideas. He did. I mean, think about the slow movement of the Fourth Symphony with its beautiful, beautiful writing for oboe and cello or the horn writing in the Rhenish or the use of the triangle in the First Symphony. He had a brilliant, brilliant imagination. He was a genius. I mean, there's no question about that. The problems happen usually in the tutties where everyone's playing and the sonority just, it just congeals. It becomes thick and requires, if you're going to do the original orchestration, a certain ability to balance the textures and an orchestra in which the different choirs, the strings versus the winds and whatnot, don't all clog together and blend where they stand out and and have a certain clarity and natural transparency of sonority. And if you can do that, then you're going to be okay. You really are. I mean, there may be issues here and there, but you'll be okay. Now, Schumann symphonies have been very lucky on disc. And the fact of the matter is that it makes sense to speak of them as cycles because conductors who do them well generally do them all well. You almost never find a dud in the batch. So although I hope to speak about individual symphonies somewhere down the road, I want to start by talking about complete cycles because you might as well get the whole batch. It's usually, usually it only involves buying two CDs or maybe three depending on couplings and you'll enjoy them all equally well because the approach will be more or less the same. There are also some horrible, awful, terrible Schumann symphony cycles. And I'm going to talk about those to begin with because it's easy. We can get rid of them, get them out of the way, and then move on to the really good stuff, which is always more fun to talk about. Well, it's more fun to talk about the bad stuff, but more productive to talk about the good stuff, right? So the bad ones. And these are some major names. Herbert von Karajan. Ugh. I mean, there's a guy whose whole sonic concept, his whole being was opposed to what Schumann's orchestration <laughs> needs, which is clarity. You know, I mean, Karajan actually, in his early days, you know, he did some, he did a good Schumann fourth. I mean, he was, you know, he wasn't quite where he later got. But then when he got his hands on the Berlin Philharmonic and, and, and molded them into the, into the Karajan, the Karajan machine with that beautiful, rich, voluptuous string sound and yummy, yummy horns and woodwinds that might as well have not bothered to show up. Well, that's a big problem in Schumann. And his Schumann symphonies are the most greasy, oily, oleaginous is the word, you know, as in oleo, margarine, you know, cheap, slimy butter substitute. You know, they, they just, they just coagulate. It's terrible. Another really surprisingly dull Schumann cycle 
is Heitings with the Concertgebouw. You know, you would think, you know, Heitings is usually very good with music that requires a lot of musicality and, and subtleties of balance and things like that. He just beats time. I mean, it's frightening. I, I saw a concert once with the Concertgebouw that he gave that was, it was one of the two concerts, or maybe three, that may probably two, that I've ever actually walked out on. Because the program, the major works anyway, were Shostakovich's Sixth Symphony and then the Schumann Second. And the Shostakovich uh, was very good, but of course they put it on the first half. Why? Because even though it's more exciting than the Schumann Second, just in terms of volume, you know, and that sort of thing, and percussion, you know, it's more of a finale kind of piece. You know, but that wasn't the German work. And of course, this being Heitink and the Concertgebouw and Germanic things, you know, that stupid idea that the German thing has to be the highlight of the concert because it's the most serious and the most symphonic. I mean, it's all such bullshit, but that's the way he did it. So we had this lovely first half. Then the second half, he starts playing the Schumann second. And oh my God, I mean, you know, there's some music that sets your pulse racing and some music that stops it completely. And this performance was dire. It was deadly, lethal. And the second is very beautifully scored in places. You know, the scherzo has lovely woodwind writing and the adagio is singing and lovely. Forget it. I left. <laughs> and, you know, I, his Schumann cycle, the, re the recordings are equally dull in my view. They're just, they're just totally mediocre in every way. Sensible tempos, sensible shoes, sensible this. Schumann was a romantic. I mean, you know, he can be played with, he has to be played in a way. Let's put it this way. He's German. He needs a concept. You can't just hope it's going to come out well if you get everybody to play everything more or less, you know, together and, and make it pretty. You know what I mean? That's what Heiting tries to do. It just sucks. But, but, the most horrible Schumann performances, bar none, come from Christian Tielemann. You know, oh my God. Now, he did the second. That was the first in this cycle. It was pretty good. I liked it. I mean, when I first heard it, I was impressed because I thought, oh, isn't this nice? He's a romantic. He's going to, you know, play with it a little and it's going to be beautiful and the playing was lovely. This is with the Philharmonia. Then he did the rest of them. And they turned out to be the most slovenly, dreary, inept, I mean inept Schumann performances I have ever heard in my life. When Schu I mean, everything that Schumann asks you to do, he either ignores entirely or he exaggerates it in a way which is detrimental to the natural flow of the music. And he's done a second Schumann cycle with the Staatskapelle Dresden, and it's even worse. So if you see the two words, Tielemann and Schumann in the same you know, place on the same disc, run, don't walk in the opposite direction. I promise you, you'll thank me. You really will. But anyway, so that's, those are the ones that I just want to scare you away from. I really do. And it, there's no point in dwelling on them. Let's talk now about the great ones because there's so many and they are so marvelous. And the music is so beautiful. And my goodness, I mean, what could be more fun than the Rhenish really? I mean, you know, it's terrific. Okay. First of all, this is the other Christian Tielemann. I saved these just so I could tell you how bad they were. Usually when I hate something, I get rid of it. But these were so bad, I kept them just so that I knew, you know, that I wasn't crazy and, and that I could show them to people as a sort of warning for future generations. Okay, I gotta stop. First of all, the biggest example of interference in Schumann's intentions is this shy cycle with the Gewandhaus in the Mahler orchestrations. Now, Mahler's orchestrations of Schumann are very interesting because, you know, you would think, this being Mahler, that he would be using, you know, e, you know glockenspiels and E-flat clarinets and all that. They're extremely, extremely considerate. And, you know, Schumann is actually heavier and louder because what Mahler is anxious to do is thin out the textures and create contrast between the winds and the strings and whatnot. So actually, he's 
he's basically what's the word what's the word he's he's sort of deconstructed the orchestration in order to make the melodic lines stand out better and he's also made cuts and done other things it's a little crazy this is not the schumann cycle to have if you are having only one but it's certainly one you'll want to hear if you love schumann and if you love mahler and if you're curious about how mahler handled another composer who he clearly loved very very much I mean, I find actually that Mahler's orchestration makes them a little bit more ineffective just because they're quieter, you know? I mean, where they need to move, he's much more interested in, in decompacting, you know, the, the sonority. And there are times, quite frankly, when you just want to have a big, heavy sonority just going pow, you know? But give it a shot if you have a chance. Now let's talk about quasi-normal Schumann cycles, ones that purport to play what Schumann actually wrote. Leonard Bernstein, a great Schumann conductor, not usually acknowledged as such, but he was. And he did two Schumann cycles. Here they are. There was the New York Philharmonic one and the Vienna Philharmonic one. They are similar in concept, except the Vienna Phil is kind of like New York Phil on steroids. These are super duper romantic performances. I don't mean that they're self-indulgent or narcissistic or ridiculous in that way. What I mean is Bernstein goes in for big climaxes and and freedom and flexibility of pulse. And he does do a lot of rebalancing of the orchestration, but he sticks more or less to Schumann's original orchestration. Now, the New York Philharmonic Cycle is very, very good, but I happen to think that the Vienna one is thrilling only because it does more of what the New York one does, only with playing that is, is God's gift to orchestral playing. I mean, the, the Vienna Philharmonic plays these things so magnificently, and Bernstein is so energized. I mean, just listen to the end of the exposition to the Spring Symphony, or the finale of the Rhenish, you know, which usually dies. I mean, it just lays there, you know. Everything is just explosive and, and vigorous and, and just full of youthful enthusiasm and energy and, and a sort of lust for life. And, and it, it's, just, it's just wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. So this is sort of the hyper-romantic approach to carry to its ultimate tasteful extreme. Another romantic approach, believe it or not, is George Sell, who you might think would be, you know, a, a dry-as-dust classicist, but not in Schumann. He's not. He understood this music. But what makes him romantic is the fact that he is very interventionist when it comes to orchestration. Not so much as Mahler was, perhaps, but almost. I mean, he really does. He's fiddling with it constantly. His tempos are moderate. He gives you time to hear everything. And he thinks that Schumann's orchestration was absolutely wonderful, of course, because he did it, <laughs> especially his redid by Zell. So there's a healthy dose of romantic ego in these performances, but that's what makes them personal. They are Zell's Schumann, and they are incredibly well done and beautiful. He was very, very proud of these. He used to say that you should do Schumann symphonies instead of Tchaikovsky. Well, you know, okay. But, you know, that's how much he personally had invested in making this cycle a success, and it is. It is. And if you get it, love it. However, there is a modern recording that adopts what you might call the romantic approach and does it so successfully and so beautifully that uh, I think that it's probably the version of choice for that approach. That and the Bernstein Vienna, which is kind of a special case. But Barenboim with the Staatskapelle Berlin. This comes from the same period as his really, really great Beethoven cycle. You know, before he started redoing his Bruckner stuff like so boringly and whatnot. This is magnificent. It is that that wonderful, dark, burnished German approach to the music. But again, with the necessary rhythm and vitality and vibrancy and attention to detail and care about balances and transparency of textures, it's magnificent. And you know, this is Barenboim's second Schumann cycle. You remember, he did an excellent Schumann cycle, really very good in Chicago. Not quite as good as this one, I think, but that one did come with the world's greatest performance of the concert stuck for four horns with the horns of the Chicago Symphony. That's something to hear all for itself, but that's a whole nother story. 
you know, maybe someday we'll do interesting concertante works that no one ever plays, and we'll talk about that recording, which is just unbelievable. In the meantime, if you're going just for the symphonies, Baron Boehm and the Staatskapelle Berlin is a wonderful, wonderful investment. There is a transitional set of Schumann symphonies. I call it that. I'm referring to this one. This is James Levine with the Philadelphia Orchestra. You know, Levine was a Zell pupil, and so, as you might expect, it has some of that, that discipline and energy and rhythmic verve, but he doesn't muck about with the orchestration the way Zell does. And the Philadelphia Orchestra just sounds wonderful in this music. It's so great to hear them do it. Um, Levine also remade the Schumann symphonies for Deutsche Grammophon, and they're not as interesting as his first cycle. I would definitely go with the Philly performances if you can find them and if you're curious about what he was doing. But now we come to a slightly different kind of Schumann. You might call it the more classical Schumann or the more classicizing Schumann. These are performances that have slightly less fluidity of tempo. They're more about, they're more about formal coherence within a movement and no less energetic, no less rhythmic, no less clear and transparent, but somehow you get the sense that there's more of an organic and cohesive, uh, you know, intelligence guiding the proceedings. And these are equally fine. I, I love both approaches. I just, it's always a sign of greatness in music that it sustains these various approaches and interpretive interpretive touches. And I, I just I, I just love listening to both. I, I mix and match, you know, I mean, it all depends on how you feel. This one, let's see. Oh, yeah. Cleveland Orchestra again, but with Dohnani. He does not mess with the orchestration. He has the Cleveland Orchestra. This is, again, from the same forces that gave us that unbelievable Dvorak 789 and the fabulous Brahms symphonies on Teldeck. It's that kind of sound, that that beautifully transparent, incredibly well-tuned, rhythmically precise, gorgeous sonority, and it works so well in the Schumann symphonies. Here's a cycle that was completely ignored when it came out. No one paid any attention to Dohnadi in Cleveland in this music, and I don't understand why. He was great with Mendelssohn. He was great with Schumann. He was fabulous in music of this period, this early German romantics, probably because I think they had a little bit of an inferiority complex as regards Beethoven, and Dohnani was out to show that they truly were great composers who wrote great music that could be made to sound wonderful if only it were played up to the very, very highest standards, and it is here, and that's definitely worth considering. However, the best of all the new versions of the classicizing variety Zinman, who also did two Schumann cycles. Now his first was on Telarc for the with the Baltimore Symphony, and it was good, but not special. Now with the Tone Hollow Orchestra of Zurich, this is this is really hot stuff, my friends. It really is. It's fabulous. I think what happened here is that this cycle shows the good side of what happens when you spend time doing period instrument stuff. Because remember, Zimmerman was doing that Beethoven cycle with the new edition and then trying to, you know, incorporate a lot of the a lot of the techniques and findings of the historically informed performance movement. And he doesn't play Schumann like that. He's not he's not trying, you know, like Gardner and those people, and they're horrible Gardner, another horrible one, Schumann cycles to prove that period instruments work wonderfully in Schumann. They don't at least not the way they're played now. But what he does is he just brings that that rhythmic incisiveness and the willingness, I think, to push the music with harder accents and bolder contrasts of texture. And this is a glorious, glorious Schumann cycle, one that you really shouldn't miss. It's completely different from, from all of the others that are out there, I think, in its in its, in its lightness, and I don't mean light in the sense of insubstantial, I mean in terms of letting the music float, <laughs> you know, across the bar lines, you know, keeping, starting the music and, and it just moves like it's self-propelled 
you won't believe you're listening to Schumann. The orchestration is so charming and consistently entrancing in these versions. This is a great, great set. And you know what's interesting? If you look at these, you'll see that, you know, you've got Dohnani, who is, you know, reasonably recent, and Zinman, and the late Bernstein. And, and, you know, there are a lot of great Schumann cycles that are fairly recent. There was sort of a gap, you know, there was sort of the old school of Schumann, and then the whole period instrument movement thing happened. And now, for some reason, people are starting to take the music more seriously, treat it with greater respect. And the result has been has been a, a series. I mean, even Baron Boims, you know, they're just they're they're newer versions by newer conductors who just seem to get Schumann. It's a fascinating phenomenon. It really is. It's just interesting. I can't explain it, but you're probably more likely to hear really good Schumann now than at any time in the past. And I think that's just, it's just a wonderful time to love Schumann, isn't it? But anyway, and there's even another one besides these, which I, I haven't talked about, but we should consider too. That's Ricardo Muti with the Vienna Philharmonic. That was originally on Phillips, an absolutely first rate Schumann cycle. Beautifully played, fresh as can be, very much in this sort of Dohnani and, and you know, that kind of, that kind of vein, that kind of sharp, crisp, clear, you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. However, there is a classic set. And if you've been reading and checking out things over the past decades, you know what the classic set is. And it deserves to be a classic set. It is Savalish with the Staatskapelle Dresden. You know, you might want to say, I know it's going to sound like sort of, you know, artificial to say so, that this is the one that combines the best of the romantic and the classicist and all that. But it does. It really does. I mean, Savalish, you know, he has a reputation, had a reputation sort of as a Kapellmeister. He was not too interesting in anything, actually, except maybe Richard Strauss once in a while. You know, he he, he could blow hot and cold, but here, here, he he's just on fire with the Staatskapelle Dresden at their all-time prime. And you also get here the Overture Scherzo and Finale, which you really want to hear, which is fabulous and goes well with the symphonies. These are completely unaffected, fresh and delicious performances of this music. I don't know how that orchestra did it. You you would never know there's an issue with orchestration. The, the, the scoring is as clear as as a mountain spring i mean it just has this pellucid quality and and the rhythm it, the rhythms are always just effortlessly projected probably because the timpani use hard sticks you know and the tempos are are urgent and fleet in in the allegros and as poetic and relaxed and 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 just delightful as you want in the slower movements except for the big adagio in the second symphony where it's, you know, of almost Brucknerian solemnity. And I mean that in the best sense, you know, it's is such a beautiful performance. It's one of those sets where everything just went right. Every so often it happened, right? We've talked about it before and this is the one. So while I would certainly not dissuade you from getting any of the great sets that we've talked about so far, I do think you need to have this as sort of your reference edition because it will help you to triangulate, you know, the unique things that the other ones do based on just the comprehensive excellence of Savalish and the Staatskapelle Dresden in Schumann. So I hope this survey has given you a pretty good overview of what's out there and what it sounds like and what your next steps ought to be. I just hope that you keep on listening to these wonderful, wonderful symphonies. I thank you so much for watching the video. And if you haven't, please consider subscribing to the channel if you enjoyed this talk. Take care.